This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is another one of the reading of the history of the Inquisition from Philip from Limborg. I've been a, two, a few days absent, but of course you don't know that because the videos are uploaded in another, <coughs> in another time than I record this. But uh, first... I actually planned to do a recording every day, but uh, I had so many other things to do that I just didn't um, come quite to fulfill that goal that I set myself. But uh, anyway, we are making some progress in this wonderful book, The History of the Inquisition, written in 1692, and getting a real history lesson, at least I am. So I hope um, the same counts for you. And I love to continue now uh, on page uh, 20, uh, 191 or something in the PDF. What is it? 1022, uh, page 23 in the in the PDF uh, or in the book of chapter five in volume two. The opinion of some of the fathers concerning the persecution of dissenters. What the, opinion of other, uh, what the opinion of those ancient doctors of the church whom we call fathers was. And then I, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I, I don't call them fathers. Um, you should always put that in, in, in uh, between quotation marks or whatever. Jesus said, call no one your father except he who is your father who, who, is, in, uh, who is in heaven. The one who is in heaven. And, and no other else, of course, your biological father, but spiritually don't call anyone your father. So I absolutely disagree with all these fathers in these books, uh, and, uh, also in this one. So when the author says, whom we call fathers, no, you should not even call them fathers. 
So what the opinion of those ancient doctors of the church, they are doctors of the church, well you can maybe call them that, even though a doctor is there to repair something that's broken, and the church of Satan is not broken, but it just can't be repaired to be to be the church of Jesus. That's another thing. <laughs> Come on, I'm getting here from, from one little detail into another. Let's just read on. What the opinion of those ancient doctors of the church, whom we call quote-unquote fathers, was, we may learn from their writings. Now look what they had to say. They wrote it down and we can read and learn from that. Athanasius, in his epistle to the Hermites, speaks in this manner of the Arians, and thus, paint, uh, and thus paints out their persecutions against the Orthodox. And, uh, little remembrance, the Orthodox here are the Roman Catholic Church, okay? As far as I understand this book. Quote, that Jewish heresy that... Uh, hath not only learned to deny Christ, but also to delight in slaughters. But even this was not sufficient to satisfy them. For as the fathers of their heresy goes about, for as the father of the heresy goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom to devour, so these having liberty to go up and down, run about, and whomsoever they happen to meet with, who either blame their flight or abhor their heresy, inhumanely tear them with scourges, or bind them with chains, or banish them from their native country. And a little after he writes, If it be, if it be a mean and dishonest thing that some bishops have changed their opinion through fear, how much more hyenas and vile is their wickedness, who, as the case generally of those who mistrust the goodness of their cause, have forced others against their will to renounce their belief. It's, no matter who does it, it's always wrong to force others to renounce their belief. Uh, let them make up their own mind. It is, it is God who judges and it is God who calls. Thus also the devil, he continues, because he hath no truth in him, invades men with the hatchet and axe, and thus violently breaks open the doors of those that receive him. The Saviour, on the contrary, is gentle. His language is, if anyone will, let him follow me and become my disciple. I absolutely agree with that. No force is used in the belief system of the creator of this world, Jesus Christ. When he comes to anyone, he doth not make use of force, but knocks at the door and says, Open to me, my sister, my spouse. If they open, he enters. If they refuse, uh, if, the, uh, if they refuse it, he departs. For truth is not to be preached by swords or darts or military weapons. Listen to this, you Catholics, but by persuasion and advice. And how can you persuade? By the word of God, the two-edged sword, by the Bible. Absolutely agree with what Athanasius says here. Yeah? For truth is not to be preached by swords or darts or military weapons, but by the persuasion and advice. But what room is there for the liberty of persuasion where men are awed by the imperial authority? And what signifies reasoning when whoever opposes is sure to be rewarded with banishments or death? And after a great deal more he thus invades against the bloody, uh, the bloody Arians. Quote, All their endeavors abound with slaughter and impiety. And such is the accursed craftiness of their temper and behavior, that they abuse and deceive men by the promises of honors, and uh, magistracies, and money. And so, when they cannot obtain the constitution of their bishopric by lawful means, they may give the more simple some appearance to a right institution, so that the very name of heathen is too good for them. 
so far are they from meriting the name of Christians, and their actions so unlike those of men that they are perfectly savage and brutal. For such is their cruelty and barbarity, that they are more bloody than the very executioners, and more vile than any other heretics, and greatly excelled even by the heathens themselves. For I have heard from the quote-unquote fathers, and I believe it true, that the persecution under Maximanius, the grandfather of Constantinus, the heathens concealed our Christian brethren when they were sought after, and were themselves oftentimes fined and imprisoned, for no other reason but because they would not betray those that fled to them, thinking themselves bound to protect them with the, sh uh, with the same fidelity as they would have expected themselves, not in the least afraid to expose themselves to danger on, what, on that account. But now these wonderful inventors of a new heresy, famous for nothing so much as their treachery, act quite the reverse. For they seek out those that conceal themselves and lay snares for those that harbor, that harbor them, and become and become of their own accord very executioners, accounting the concealed and the concealer equally their enemy, so that they are naturally bloody and murderous, and, and rivals of the wickedness of Judas. Tis indeed impossible that any words can sufficiently describe their actions." Unquote. What would not this doctor have said? had he seen the cruel laws of the Inquisition brought into use, by which it is not only a crime to conceal an heretic, but all who do not inform against him are anathematized as favorers and defenders of heretics and hinderers of the office of the, in uh, of the Inquisition and condemned to other punishments according to the arbitrary will of the Inquisitors. He would un... Uh, he would unquestionably, unquestionably have complained that he wanted words to describe such an execrable, execrable cruelty. For if what the Arians did was beyond description, how much less can any word give just representation of the barbarity of the Inquisitors, which is as much superior to the cruelty uh, of the Arians as theirs was, according to Athanasius, to that of the heathens. But Athanasius even goes on, quote, Oh, their new heresy! Such are the wickedness and the impieties that let the devil be ever so bad. This will appear to be the devil all over. Such a monstrous evil never rose up before, for those who had an heretical opinion used to keep their thoughts and sentiments to themselves. But now Eusebius and Arius, like serpents crawling out of their dens, vomit openly the poison of their impious sect, this taking the liberty quickly to blaspheme, and, uh, and the others as publicly to defend his blasphemy. But this, uh, but this he could not defend till he had found an emperor to support his blasphemy. On the other hand, the fathers in the general council of about 300 bishops condemned the Arian heresy and showed that it was contrary to the faith of the church. Well, yeah, okay, it was contrary to the faith of the church. Was it also contrary to the faith of the Bible? Huh? Interesting, huh? Only when something is contrary to the Bible, it should be heresy, it should be heathen. Yeah, but that's another point, so. He continues in this quote here. But the defenders of the sect, seeing themselves despised and being able to allege nothing agreeable to reason, have invented a new way and attempted to support themselves by the secular power in which one cannot help being amazed at their insolence and wickedness and how much it exceeds all other heresies. For the madness of other heresies consists in persuasive words in order to deceive the simple. And as for the heathens, the apostle tells us, they deceive men by their eloquence and oratory and subtle speeches. And the Jews, 
forgetting the scriptures, contend about fables and endless genealogies. The Manichaeans also, and Valentinians, and the other heretics endeavor to support their trifles by adultering and corrupting the sacred scriptures. But the Arians, more perverse than all the rest, plainly declare all the other kindred heresies to be inferior to theirs since they allow themselves in much more impious practices and endeavor to rival all others, but especially the Jews and their wickedness and villainies. For as they immediately brought Paul for, uh, before the governor's tribunal, whom they could not convict of the crimes objected to him, so these every day uh, every day devising fresh tricks, use no other arguments but the power of the judges. And if any one but once contradicts them, uh, but if any one but once contradicts them, he is immediately dragged before the governor and captain. And farther, other heretics being overcome by the demonstration of the truth, shut their mouth in silence and have nothing to do but to blush upon conviction. But this new and execrable heresy, when overcome with reason and put to shame by the power of truth, endeavors to bring men to its interest by violence, stripes and jails, when words prove ineffectual to persuade them. And even by this shows itself to be an enemy to true piety and the worship of God. For it is the property of true religion not to force but to persuade. Now we have to understand that we are speaking here the worship of God, not the God of the Roman Catholicism. No, we are speaking here of the word of uh, of, of the worship of the uh, of the Creator God, the God of the Bible. For it is the poverty, uh, it is the property of true religion, the religion of the God, the Creator, not to force but to persuade. Thus our Lord, far from forcing men, left them to the liberty of their own will, commonly thus speaking to all, If any one will come after me, and to his disciples, and will you go away also? But what is more suitable to the nature of such an heresy as this, which is quite repugnant to true religion, and in rebellion to Christ, avows Constantinus as the author of its, uh, of, uh, its impiety, hereby making him, as it were, an antichrist, what more agreeable to its nature than to act in defiance to the Saviour. In his first apology for his flight, he speaks to the same purpose and in the first place to prevent the Arians imputing these persecutions to the judges and so pronouncing themselves innocent, he says, quote, what the judges seem to do, they are the true authors of, or rather, they make themselves the tools to execute, to execute the sentence and malice of the judges, unquote. And afterwards he shows from what they've learned, uh, from whom they learned these persecutions, quote, Pray let them tell me, since whatever is said to them, they pretend is unworthy their regard. Whence they have learned the doctrine of persecution? Surely they had it not from the saints. It therefore follows that, it must have received, that they must have received it from the devil, whose language is, I will pursue and overtake. It is the command of God and agreeable to the practice of the saints that we should fly, but to persecute is the invention of the devil, who being an enemy to all, is desirous of exciting everywhere persecution. Unquote. In this and the like manner, Athanasius, whilst persecuted by the Arians, largely and pathetically argues, condemning persecution of every sort upon the score of religion, and freely pronouncing it the invention of the devil. That is a very important sentence. We can mark this a little bit and highlight this and read it again. In this and, li and the like manner, Athanasius, whilst persecuted by the Arians, largely pathetically argues condemning persecution of every sort upon the score of religion and freely pronouncing it the invention of the devil. I couldn't agree with Athanasius more, I have to tell you. The persecution 
on the basis of belief is from the devil. Only the devil wants to get you by force to believe and to follow and to worship him. Jesus Christ leaves that up to you. You have the free choice. He chooses, he knocks, you open or you don't. But you will never ever be forced to follow Jesus Christ. Never. But you will be forced to follow the Jesus Christ of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Jesus Christ of the Roman Catholic Church is the Tammuz from Babylon. And therefore is not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. The Jesus Christ of the Bible does not use force, but reason and his word and his two-edged spiritual sword, the Bible. And yet we do not find that this same Athanasius made the least intercession with the Emperor Constantine when the Nicene Synod was ended to prevent the banishment of Arius and his followers. No, nor one single word to show that he even disapproved of Arius' banishment through, to a, uh, through a too common weak, a weakness of mind whereby men were apt to think that the same thing done to them by others would be, not un uh, would be most unjust that would not be unjust in them to do to others. So, speaking on the, out of the one side of his mouth the truth by saying that persecution of every sort upon the score of religion is an invention from the devil yeah? and on the other hand not condemning the banishment of others I mean banishment is not persecution I have to tell you also I mean when you have a realm where you rule and where the word of Christ rules supreme in and then you have somebody else who teaches heresy in that realm and you banish him that's not persecution that is defending your freedom of the Bible we have to consider this in this writing here so I am I do not agree with the, uh, with the writer when uh, he doesn't condemn Athanasius for not crying out when Emperor Constantine banishes other people because of their belief system that's okay but banishing is not persecuting banishing is not killing okay even though I don't say that Constantine was right here don't get me wrong but I just say banishment is not persecution. Now Hilarius against Oxentius the Arian shows with equal eloquence his, uh, de his detestation of cruelty towards men differing in their religious sentiments. Quote, and first I cannot help p uh, pitying the misfortune of our age and lamenting the absurd opinions of the, uh, of the present times, according to which human arts must support the cause of God and the cause of Christ uh, be defended by methods of secular ambition. I beseech you, O ye bishops, who believe yourselves to be such, meaning bishops, what helps did the apostles make use of in propagating the gospel? What powers assisted them in preaching Christ and converting all nations from idols to God? <laughs> that was the Holy Spirit. But had they any but had they any of the nobles from the pellets joining with them when they sung hymns to God in prison and in chains and after they had been cruelly scorched? Did Paul gather the church of Christ by virtue of the royal edict when he himself was made a spectacle in the public theatre? Was the preaching of the divine truth protected by Nero, Vespasian or Decius, which 
flourished by means of their very hatred towards us? Had they not the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Surely they had, though they maintained themselves by their own hands and labors, met together in garrets and secret places and traveled by sea and land over almost all the nations, towns and cities of the earth in opposition to the edicts both of senate and kings? Did not mince hatred of the gospel manifest the divine power, and that the more Christ was forbidden to be preached, he was the more preached in the world? Did not mince hatred of the gospel manifest the divine power, and that the more Christ was forbidden to be preached, he was still the more preached in the world? Yes, I read this twice because this is very important to understand. Um, when we go into Revelation, we are speaking about this ten days of uh, tribulation in there um, that can be related to the hardest persecution in the years 303 to 310 AD. For a thousand Christians they killed, 10,000 stood up, and for 10,000 they killed, 100,000 stood up. They just couldn't eradicate the word of God and the word of Jesus Christ in this world. Did not mince hatred of the gospel, meaning the persecution on the, uh, on the very first judges at that time, manifest the divine power in that the more Christ was forbidden to be preached, meaning killed the people who, who, who preached Jesus Christ, that he was still the more preached in the world? Yes, absolutely yes. This is a very, very important part. The more God is forbidden and taken out of our life, the more Christ will manifest himself in us. A very important sentence. I'm going to read it again. Min's hatred of the gospel manifests the divine power and that the more Christ was forbidden to be preached, he was still the more preached in the world. But now, he continues, O wretched case, earthly suffrages are to recommend the divine faith and Christ is declared to be destitute of power, since ambition is become the means of reconciling men to his name. The church now terrifies men by banishments and jails, which was at first believed in the means of banishments and jails. She now relies on the dignity of her communicants. Though at first consecrated by the terror of her persecutors, she now puts her priests to flight. Though she was at first propagated by the flight of her priests. She now glories that she is beloved of the world, though she could not belong to Christ unless the world hated her. And in his first book to Constantine, to the same purpose, he writes, quote, God rather chose to each man the knowledge of himself than forcibly demanded, and by gaining authority of his own precepts, by wonderful heavenly works, showed that he disdained a mind compelled even to the acknowledgement of himself. If such a method as this was made use of to propagate the true faith, the episcopal doctrine should agree with it and say, he is the God of the whole world and needs not a constrained obedience. He does not require a forced confession. He is not to be deceived but engaged. He is to be worshipped, not for his own sake, but for our sake. I can accept him only that is willing. Hear him I can accept him only that is willing. Hear him only that prays, and heal him only that freely confesses him. He is to be sought with simplicity of mind to be learned by humble confession, to be loved with true affection, to be reverenced with fear, and his favor to be secured by an honest mind. But what strange thing it is that the priests are forced by chains and severe penalties to fear God. The priests are kept in prison, the people are bound in chains, Virgins are stripped naked and their bodies 
consecrated to God, exposed by way of punishment to public view, made an open spectacle and fitted for the torture. Ambrose also taught the same doctrine. The apostles are not commanded to take rods in their hands, as Matthew writes. What is a rod but an ensign of power and an instrument of vengeance to inflict pain? And therefore the disciples of an humble master, I say of an humble master, for in his humility his judgment was taken from him, can only perform the duty he hath enjoined them by offices of humility. For he sent persons forth to uh, to uh, to sow the faith, who should not force men, but teach them, nor exercise power, but exalt the doctrine of humility. And a little after he adds, quote, when the apostles would have had five from, sorry, when the apostles would have had fire from heaven to consume the Samaritans, who would not receive the Lord Jesus Christ into their city, be turned he turned about and rebuked them, saying, Ye know not what spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Gregory Narianzen evidently shows himself to be of the same sentiment, although he hath not handled this argument professedly. For having for having observed that men were not easily and at once, but slowly and gradually brought off from idolatry to the law, and from the law to the gospel. <laughs> I would like to see that today. Having observed that men were not easily and at once, but slowly and gradually brought off from idolatry to the law, to the law and from the law to the gospel. I would even like today see examples of people who you can get slowly but gradually from idolatry to the law. I don't think that works even slowly and gradually. I have seldomly seen that working. Have you? Leave a comment, let me know. And having considered the reason of it, he thus speaks, quote, And why is it thus? Because we are to know that men are not to be driven by force, but to be drawn by persuasion. For that which is forced is not lasting, this even the waves teach us, when they are repelled by violence. And the very plans went by, uh, and the very plans when bent contrary to their nature. That which is voluntarily is both more lasting and safe. This is agreeable to the divine equity. The other, an instance of tyranny. So that he did not think it just even to do good to men against their will or without their consent. And in the poem of his own life, he speaks to the same purpose. Quote, Persuasions much more just than violence, fitter for us and those whom we attempt, to reconcile unto the being supreme. What by compulsions done can never last. Like this the bending bow and stream repelled, the force removed by their own power return to native form and place, scorning restraints. Scorning restraint. That's only durable which which is the effect of free consent and choice. Love leads the way and steady keeps by kind yet powerful influence. Unquote. Optatus Milevetinus, writing against Parmenius, the Donatists, vindicates the Church from the charge of persecuting dissenters from it. For when Parmenius objected to the Catholics, quote, that cannot be called the Church which feeds on cruel dainties and grows fat with the flesh and blood of the saints. Well, this is a very interesting quote about the Roman Catholic Church, don't you think? <laughs> I have to highlight this and read that again. Listen. For when Parmenianus objected to the Catholics, quote, that cannot be called the Church, which feeds on cruel dainties and grows fat 
with the flesh and blood of the saints. Ha. Optatus thus answers him, quote, The church hath its proper members, the bishops, presbyters, deacons, ministers, and the body of the faithful. To which of these different orders in the church can you impute what you object? Point out, if you can, by name, any minister or deacon, or instance in any one presbyter of that that hath been concerned in it, or any bishop who hath approved it. What one amongst us hath endeavoured to ensnare, or hath persecuted any person? Declare, if you can, and prove one single instance of persecution by us." Unquote. <laughs> I think this book is just about doing this. In this passage he plainly acknowledges that the Church ought not to feed on cruel dainties and denies that the Donatists can, with truth, object this to his own Church, through, indeed, this, farced, uh, this scarce to be believed, when one considers the edicts of the Emperors against the Donatists and other heretics. But he goes on and largely shows that the Donatists themselves have fed on these cruel dainties and, seat, uh, and feasted on Christian blood. And at length he concludes, quote, See, your own party have made good what you yourself have confessed, that that, that cannot be the church which feeds on cruel dainties. Missionary dragoons and ordained bishops are vastly different. What you have falsely laid to our charge hath been done by others, not by us. And what you have owned to be unlawful to do, you yourselves have acted. Unquote. What what Chrysostom's sentiment in this affair, he himself sufficiently declares in his sermon about excommunication, where he thus inveighs against those who pronounced others accursed. Quote, I see men who understand not the genuine sense, nor indeed anything of the sacred writings, who, to pass by other things, I am not ashamed to own, are furious, triflers, quarrelsome, who know not what they say, nor whereof they affirm. Bold and peremptory, a bold and peremptory in this one thing, ever determining articles of faith and declaring uh, uh, cursed things they understand not. Upon this account we are come to the scorn, uh, we, are, we are become the scorn of the enemies of our faith, who look upon us as persons that have no regard for virtue and never learned to do good. How am I afflicted and grieved for these things? And afterwards, citing that place of St. Paul, in 2 Timothy uh, 2, verses 24, 5 and 6, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle, and he goes on, entice him with the bait of the compassion, and thus endeavor to draw him out of the destruction, that being thus delivered from the infection of his former error, he may live, and thou mayest deliver this, thy soul. But if he obstinately refuses to hear witness against him, let thou become guilty. Only let it be with long suffering and gentleness, lest the judge require his soul at my hand. Let him not be hated, shunned, or persecuted, but exercise towards him a sincere and fervent charity. And at length he thus concludes, quote, Impious and heretical principles are to be opposed and anathematized, but men themselves are to be spared, and we must pray for their salvation. Unquote. If this was his opinion as to those who anathematize others only upon the account of heresy, how zealous would he have been against such who, not content to pronounce heretics accursed, deliver them over to the secular arm to, the, to be most cruelly punished? He farther declares his opinion in his eighth homily, homily on the first of Genesis. Quote, Heretics may be compared to persons in a disease, and that are almost deprived of their sight. 
for as the one cannot bear the light of the sun through the, weak, uh, through the weakness of their eyes, and the other throws, uh, throws illness nauseate the most wholesome food, so they, being, dis, uh, being distempered in their minds and darkened in their understanding, cannot endure to behold the light of truth. We ought, therefore, in discharge of our duty, to hold out the helping hand and speak to them with great meekness. For thus St. Paul has advised, saying that our adversaries are to be instructed with gentleness, if peradventure God may give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, and that they may escape out of the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him in his will. So that, there is need, uh, so that there is need of a double measure of gentleness and forbearance to deliver and bring him out of the snares of the devil. Unquote. Now, but in his 47th homily upon Matthew, the, uh, Matthew tw uh, 13, explaining the parable of the tares, he doth not condemn all sorts of external violence against heretics. Quote, Wilt thou therefore that we go and gather them up? But the Lord forbade it, lest also ye pluck up the wheat with the tares, which he said to prevent wars and effusion of blood and slaughter. For if heretics were to be killed, a bloody and eternal war would spread itself through the world. And therefore he forbids it on a double account. The one, that the wheat might not be burned. The other, that unless they were healed, they could not escape the severest punishment. Therefore, if you would punish them and not hurt the corn, you must wait for the proper time and season. What then doth he mean when he says, Left also ye pluck up, lest also ye pluck up the wheat? Undoubtedly this, that if you take up arms, you must necessarily destroy many of the saints together with the heretics, or that even some of these may be changed into the true wheat. If therefore you too hastily pluck them out, you will destroy all that good wheat, which might have been produced out of the very tares. But he doth not forbid us to confine, or shut the mouths of heretics, or to binder their liberty of speech, or to hinder their liberty of speech, or synodical assemblies, or prevent their union, but only to murder and destroy them." Unquote. This is a very interesting point of view on Matthew 13, I have to say. This is exactly what it's all about. And we have to leave it to God and not to ourselves to, in this case, judge. For in this case, to not persecute. I mean, the disciples were asking Jesus, uh, aren't, we, aren't we to put out the, uh, the tares from the wheat? And he says, no. Let them grow together, and when the time of the harvest is come, then first the one and then the other will be harvested. And that's how Matthew 13 is to be understood. And we will read that uh, probably another time, because this is really, really very interesting to read. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I was a little bit interrupted because there was someone at the door and my dog started barking and everything and uh, because I'm expecting someone to visit so that took me a little bit out of the concentration here. But this what we've just read um, on Matthew 13. Um, I'm going to read it again because I really like what I read here. Wilt thou therefore that we go and gather them up? But the Lord forbade it, lest also ye pluck up the wheat with the tares, which he said to prevent wars and effusion of blood and slaughter. For if heretics were to be killed, a bloody and eternal war would spread itself through the world. And therefore he forbids it on a double account, the one that the wheat might not be burned, the other that unless they were healed, they could not escape the severest punishment. Therefore, if you would punish them and not hurt the corn, you must wait for the proper time and season, the harvest season. What then doth he mean when he says, lest thee also pluck up the wheat? Undoubtedly this, that if you take up arms, you must necessarily destroy many of the saints with the heretics, 
or that even some of these may be changed into the true wheat. If therefore you too hastily pluck them up, you will destroy all that good wheat which might have been produced out of the very tares. But he doth not forbid us to confine or shut the mouths of heretics, or to hinder their liberty of speech, or synodical assemblies, or prevent their union, but only to murder and destroy them. Unquote. Really, really interesting little paragraph. I'm going to highlight that for future references, probably. So St. Jerome is of the same mind who in the 62nd letter to Theo. Uh, Theophilus against John of Jerusalem thus speaks quote, The Church of Christ was founded on the bloody sufferings and the patience of its first professors and not on their abusing and adjuring others. It grew by persecutions and triumphed by martyrdoms. Unquote. For though he shows himself very severe against heretics, Yet he was not for punishing them with death, but treating them with gentleness. Thus, in his comment on Hosea 2, uh, verse 1, he says, quote, You that believe in Christ, whether Jews or Gentiles, say ye to the branches that are broken off, and the people that is cast out, My people, for he is thy brother, and my sister, for she hath obtained mercy. When the fullness of the Gentiles shall come in, then shall all Israel be saved. This is commanded us, that we should not wholly despair of heretics, but provoke them to repentance, and with a brotherly affection with their salvation. And explaining the parable of the tares in Matthew 13, he says, quote, Wherefore he who governs the church ought not to sleep, lest through his negligence the enemy should saw the tares, meaning heretical opinions. But whereas the said left gathering the tares, he pluck up also the corn, tis to show us that there is a place for repentance and that we ought not hastily to cut off our brother, because it may happen that he who today is inflicted with a territorial brevity may repent tomorrow and become a defender of the truth. Unquote. Also, a very interesting point of view and, uh, uh, and interpretation of Matthew 13. And in his commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 9, quote, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Among other things, he's, he has this, quote, A spark is to be extinguished as, from it, uh, from as soon as it appears, and the leaven not to be suffered to approach the lump. Corrupted flesh is to be cut off, and scaby oh, that's, that's a word I don't know maybe you guys can help me scaby sheep huh? never heard that word to be driven from the sheepfold left the whole house lump body and flock should be burned, leavened, corrupted and perish Arius at first was but a single spark which because it was not immediately extinguished set on fire and ravaged the whole world. Unquote. This ends chapter 5 here and these two commentaries on um, Matthew chapter 13 I find very intriguing and very interesting. So I'm going to read the second one here once again. I also highlight that for future references. So we are speaking of <coughs> Uh, who, who speaks here uh, anyway he says wherefore he who governs the church ought not to sleep lest through his negligence the enemy should, uh, should sow the tares meaning heretical opinions uh, his enemy that's the devil he is the sower of the tares but whereas tis said lest gathering the tares ye pluck up also the corn tis to show us that there is a place for repentance and we ought not hastily to cut off our brother because it may happen 
that he who today is inflicted with heretical pravity may repent tomorrow and become a defender of the truth. It is not on ours to judge. And there is a... <clears throat> I think it is in, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians. I read that one of these days in the Bible study. You have to read through the book of Corinthians. Um, where you can see where this is also repeated. I mean, he is speaking here about Matthew 13, and he is uh, giving an explanation of that. But um, uh, that is also in Corinthians, and then later on it is said also that we are provoke them to uh, to jealousy, right? Uh, say thee to the branches that are broken off and the people that is cast out my people for he is thy brother and my sister for he hath obtained mercy when the fullness of the Gentiles shall come in it then shall all Israel be saved this is commanded us that we should not wholly despair of heretics but provoke them to repentance provoke them to repentance or provoke them even to jealousy as we are to provoke the Jews to jealousy as I think in Romans chapter 10 if I'm not mistaken that we have to provoke the Jews to jealousy because we because uh, they stumbled the Gentiles actually we the Gentiles have had the gift of salvation Therefore, we should provoke them to jealousy. And here we should provoke uh, the heretics to repentance, to show them their wrongdoings and to show them how much better the whole life, even the eternal life, could be than what they actually think of. Uh, I think these two passages here from on page 29 uh, that are highlighted here, the one on, on, on Matthew 13 and the one that I just read to you again here. Matthew 13, these are some very interesting teachings that I will cut out and uh, discuss a little bit in the future. Really interesting. But I've come here to the end of uh, chapter 6 and as I said, I'm expecting a friend of mine to visit so I cannot do the full hour recording today. Um, you will probably excuse me for that. So I will stop right here and the next time continue on page 30 in volume 2 of the book History of the Inquisition in chapter 6, which is called St. Augustine's Opinion Concerning the Persecution of Heretics. Yeah, let's see about what quote-unquote St. Augustine has to say about that. Also a so-called early church quote-unquote father. Yeah? Who was not that righteous as you probably think already. We will deal with him next time in chapter 6. And um, until that time, until next time in chapter 6 and another part of the reading, the history of the Inquisition. Joggler66, thanks you very much for watching and listening to the video. And until next time, may God bless you. Bye bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.